Tiana. I'm one of the dietitians here at Pro Healthcare, and I get the pleasure of talking about this volumetrics um, theme this morning, more food, less calories. And when we are talking about diets and wanting to lose weight, there's a lot of people that are doing it. On average, there's over 20 million Americans that'll be on a diet at any point in time in a year. Um, a lot of money is spent in the diet industry, at least $60 billion every single year. And as most of us, if not all of us know, a diet can work for a specified amount of time, but it's really tough to stick with it long term. So overall, we see an average weight loss of generally less than five pounds and over 95% of the weight that is lost is usually regained within five years. Um, we also may know firsthand, or we've probably heard before, that it's really common that when we lose weight and then regain it, we generally regain more than we had lost to begin with. So if we start at 200 pounds and we lose 10, we're down to 190. If we get off of that diet or we rebound in any way, it's likely that we are going to end up more than 200 when everything kind of shakes out. Only about half to 1% of people who reach their goal weight will actually maintain that goal weight for over five years. I tell people it's relatively easy in the grand scheme of things to lose weight. It's keeping it off that is the real battle. And so when we think about diets and really what kind of gets in the way, well, most of us say, okay, well, I'm just going to eat less calories. I'm just going to eat less food. I'm just going to eat smaller portions. I'm just going to eat less. Okay, and in theory, yeah, that sounds great, but what does that do? Generally can lead us to feelings of deprivation. When we tell ourselves, no, you can't have that, what are we thinking about? The thing we said we can't have. Um, I use the example of don't think about a pink elephant sitting in your living room right now. Boom, one just showed up. When we tell our brains, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't, our brains are going to say, no, yes, I can. That's all I'm thinking about because you said I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And so those feelings of deprivation can lead to those rebound overeating or binge episodes where, yes, I'm really going to grind in for a day, a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. But the second that I'm presented with a Pringle or the second that I'm presented with a party or I'm just having a really tough day and I just can't hang on anymore, we can't generally overeat go too far, and now we're like this ping pong back and forth. Well, when that happens, it can lead to feelings of guilt and shame um, for folks that have an emotional relationship with food, meaning that we eat for reasons other than physical hunger. We eat because we're bored, we eat because we're sad, we eat because we're stressed, we eat because we're happy. Well, if we bring emotions into the mix of our diet and maybe we feel guilty about a choice, well, what's that gonna do? Going to increase our urge to want to eat, and the cycle continues. Um, some people will consume too few calories. They'll try to cut too much, right? They'll be eating a thousand calories a day. Not only can this lead to nutrient deficiencies, but when we eat too few calories, our body kind of slows everything down in a way to preserve or really maximize the energy that we're giving it. So this can lead to decreased metabolism. This can lead to increased fat storage. Um, our body stores fat as a way to be able to access energy later. It's the most condensed form of energy. So if we aren't consuming enough and our body's slowing down and our body's trying to hang on to everything that we're giving it because it doesn't know when it's gonna get enough in the future, well, that's gonna increase our body's ability and, and proclivity to store excess fat. And I'm gonna make a big assumption that when we're talking about dieting and losing weight, we're not trying to be losing our muscle mass. We're trying to get rid of that fat. Um, and then in the end, like I said, the majority of people are going to regain the weight that they lost. So if we limit our calories just by simply eating less, we're more than likely going to feel hungry and we're going to feel deprived. And I'm going to assume that most people don't enjoy the sensation of hunger. They don't enjoy the muscle or the stomach cramps, the emptiest, the gurgles. Maybe you get headaches, maybe you get fatigued, shaky, lightheaded. I mean, none of that sounds pleasant. So we really can't just look at this as I'm going to eat less food. I'm going to eat less calories because that's more than likely not going to result in what you want long term. Some foods, 
keep us full and satisfied a lot longer than others. So if we can start to focus on more volume of food, less calories overall, this concept of volumetrics is going to come in where you can still eat and you can eat to satiety and you can eat to fullness, but overall your daily caloric intake week after week after week is going to add up to potential weight loss. So I want you guys to think about this example of breakfast. How many of us have had a bowl of cereal or like a plain bagel or something and you're hungry like an hour later, right? You can eat breakfast at eight, nine o'clock and by 10 o'clock you're like, I need a snack versus maybe on the weekend, you've got more time, you make yourself a veggie, ham, egg, omelet, something, you know, I was gonna say it has more protein in it and you can make it all the way to lunch. You don't even think about a snack. You don't even think about eating because you felt fuller for this longer period of time. This is the concept that we're really going to talk about today is really focusing on the right types of foods to keep you fuller longer, but overall reduce your daily caloric intake. So this volumetrics plan um, is a research-based eating pattern that's done from a professor at Penn State University. And according to the, what is it, the US News and World Report, we see this come out every year of like top diet plans, all ranked based on research and criteria and whatnot. This eating plan has made the top 10 list since 2014. Um, I think this past year, it might be the top five. Uh, so year after year after year, there's a lot of research to support that it works and that it's a, it's a healthy plan. It doesn't tell you you can't eat certain things. It doesn't remove whole food groups. It just encourages you to focus on the types of foods that are going to keep you fullest the longest so that you don't have to be eating all day long. And so that you really kind of maximize that full factor on the least amount of calories. So these are gonna be high protein foods, high fiber foods, and really focusing on this idea of volume. You know, how much space is being taken up in your stomach? Because that's one of the things that keeps us full. So we're gonna talk about energy density. So energy density is a lot of calories per bite. And I have my fun little food models here. When we think about feeling full or think about this idea of volume, our body and our stomach experience a full factor when stress, stretch receptors are activated and when our body senses there's enough weight in the stomach to feel full. Well, if we are going to try to capitalize on the lowest calories, most volume, most full, we got to talk about energy density. A lot of calories per bite means that 10 bites of one thing versus 10 bites of another can add up to very different caloric or energy totals, but your fullness might be the same. So if we think about something like peanut butter, one tablespoon of peanut butter, which is a very high fat food, you can see it has nine calories per gram. This is a very energy dense food. One tablespoon of peanut butter, is not very much, for some people this just might be one bite, is equal to about 100 calories. Versus medium-sized banana, this is primarily carbohydrate. You can see that for carbs, it's only four calories per gram. This is about 100 calories. These two things come in very different sized packages, their volumes are different, but they provide us the same amount of energy. It's gonna be really easy to eat six of these. It's not as easy to eat six of these in one sitting because this is going to provide us a lot more fullness. It's gonna feel heavier. It's going to limit us from getting to that six in one setting. So we really want to be mindful of this energy density. I have another example here. So you can see 100 calories is between a quarter cup of raisins or one cup of grapes. These are two very different sizes, but they both give us the same amount of overall energy. When we talk about weight, we wanna make sure we're not consuming more calories than our body can use. Kind of like thinking about going to the gas station when your tank's full, and you're gonna put more gas in it because it's got nowhere to go. Our bodies work the same way. We gotta make sure we're putting in the right amount of energy for the energy that we're using. We really want to make sure that we are limiting these really energy dense foods and focusing on higher volume foods because they're going to fill our stomachs with a lot less calories. So here's another example. Two Oreos is about 105 calories, or you can have a whole bunch of strawberries for about 96. Same amount of calories, similar number, but 
very different pull factor. You could eat eight, 10, 12 Oreos in one sitting, but to eat more than 16 or 20 strawberries would be a little more difficult. You may not sit there and eat 100 strawberries to equate to the same amount of calories or energy that we would get from something like Oreo cookies or chips or whatnot. So that's really kind of the, the base principle of what we're gonna talk about this morning is what are the foods that give us the most volume, the least amount of calories, right? So more food or physical volume of food, you don't need to look at the plate and have five bites and say, hey, this isn't gonna fill me up. No, we wanna fill up that plate. We just wanna fill it up with the stuff that's gonna provide you a more appropriate amount of calories to really support your weight loss efforts. So like I had mentioned, the weight of food a person eats is more consistent day to day than the number of calories. So your volumes of food may look different day to day, right? Um, but calorically, they're gonna kind of all be similar depending, right? So we wanna make sure that um, throughout the course of the day, we are focusing on kind of the heaviest foods for the least amount of calories. So we're getting the most bang for our buck because I know that some people think that their stomachs are really, really large. Our stomach organ isn't so big. And yes, it does stretch when we put things in it. Those stretch receptors being activated are what tell our brain, hey, we're getting full. So then the brain can go down and really kind of feel that sensation to help us to stop. Well, we wanna put heavy foods or high volume foods. And what you're gonna find out is we're gonna talk a lot about like, high water content foods, like fruits and vegetables have a very high water content, so strawberries, is a lot of that volume is made up of water. Well, water has a weight, but water doesn't have calories. So we're putting these heavier foods in, we can eat a good amount of them, but they aren't coming with a really high amount of calories associated. You can see here, we look at something like oil or butter, which is all fat. Well, 500 calories of that is not gonna take up very much space in our stomach. Cheese, nuts, these are things that are going to be a little less fat compared to just like straight oil. They might have some protein, they might have some other stuff. They take up a little bit more. Potatoes, rice, beans, higher starch foods, our proteins, lean meat and fish, and then our produce. Each one of these is about 500 calories, but you can see that they take up a lot of different kind of size spaces in our stomach. The one on the right is gonna provide us the greatest full feeling because our stomach is the most full. Those stretch receptors are the most activated. So this is really what we're gonna wanna capitalize when we are selecting our foods. The idea of volumetrics is a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, it's going to be lean meats. You're gonna have some beans, whole grains, focusing on higher fiber, and limiting things that are more highly processed, limiting things that are generally very high in fat, only because we want to, again, maximize on that idea of volume for the least amount of calories. So when we think about, um, like I had mentioned, but this is gonna be a little more specific, think about kind of how we wanna build our day. We want the majority of our intake to come from these very low energy dense foods. Your non-starchy fruits and vegetables, clear soups, broth-based soups, things like that. You know, you think of a, a, a vegetable soup versus um, a chowder, right? You can have the same one cup. They can both come in a one cup serving, but that broth-based soup that's got veggies and beans and whole grains or a lean meat in it versus a chowder that's going to have cream and butter and much higher fat. Well, you might be looking at 100 or 150 calories for a broth base for the one cup versus that chowder could easily be 500 or more calories for that same one cup. Well, both of these cups are going to fill the same amount of space in our bellies, but the one is going to give us significantly less overall calories, so our body is less likely to store that and have uh, overall excess in the day. So we really want to focus on these very low energy dense foods as kind of the, the base of our meal planning. Then we want to incorporate some low energy dense foods. We think about things like starchy fruits and vegetables. Um, and just to clarify what those are, uh, most common starchy fruit is going to be banana or plantain. 
And then starchy vegetables are traditionally potatoes of any kind, including sweet potato, corn, uh, sweet peas. So you think of like frozen sweet peas or canned peas, not the ones that come in the pod like a snow pea, but just the straight pea itself is gonna have a very high starch content. Um, and most winter squashes, things like acorn, butternut, hubbards, these are just gonna have a, a higher starch content and they would be considered starchy vegetables. Low fat meats and poultry, your beans and your legumes. Um, medium energy dense foods, we're gonna wanna incorporate these sparingly, higher fat meats, cheeses that are gonna have a higher fat content, pizza, french fries, that type of stuff. And then your high energy dense foods, these we want to minimize as much as possible, save them for special occasions. Um, again, this isn't about deprivation to say you're never allowed to eat a cookie, you're never allowed to have a cupcake on your birthday, but our birthdays happen once a year. We really don't want to be incorporating these things in on a daily, weekly basis, just because we're really not going to be getting the most bang for our buck from a volume versus calorie um, breakdown. So I'm going to give you a little um, kind of tool to figure out the energy density of particular foods. Generally speaking, um, in the world of volumetrics, our best options are going to have fewer calories than grams of weight per serving. I'm gonna show you an example on the next slide. We're gonna look at some labels. Um, but overall, we just want our calories to be less than the weight of the food. The things that we want to incorporate moderation, are going to be when we've got about the same number of calories per weight or per gram of food. And then the things that we want to minimize as much as possible are gonna have over two times more calories per gram. So what in the world does that mean? Let's look at the one on the left. These are gonna be just traditional potato chips. And I have highlighted the calories at 160 for the serving size of 28 grams. So sometimes people get confused, like what in the world does that mean? The way that nutrition labels work is they are always going to provide you what's called a household measure. So the 15 chips is a household measure. A quarter cup is a household measure. Two tablespoons, household measure. They're also going to provide you a more specific weight of that serving. So that if you were to have a food scale at home, and you were going to weigh out a serving of these potato chips, they would weigh 28 grams. Well, you can see that the calories are significantly bigger than those grams of the serving. They're about six times bigger. This would be one of those foods we would want to minimize in this volumetrics plan, because this is telling me that I'm gonna be getting a relatively small weight like benefit in my stomach, I'm gonna get a lot of calories in that. So I'm gonna need to eat multiple servings of this to start to feel full versus you can see the apple and I need to look at my own or move you guys because you're in my, there we go. Um, we can see that a medium apple, medium apple being the household measure, if we were to weigh it on a food scale, 100, 182 grams, so it would weigh 182 grams. Well, there's only 95 calories in that 182 grams or that weight of the food. That's about half as much. You're going to get a lot more bang for your buck here. Think about how many servings of those potato chips you would need to eat to equate to the single apple in terms of the weight benefit that you would feel in your stomach. You're going to have to eat two, four, six, eight, ten servings, and now we count up all the calories in there. For the same weight benefit between these two foods. So this is basically what volumetrics is, is saying and has proven through their research that when we can maximize the smallest amount of calories in the heaviest or the most volume-based foods, it's going to be easier to limit our calories without feeling hungry all day or hangry all day, without feeling levels of deprivation, without doing the I'm restricting, I'm overeating, I'm going back and forth, I've got a good day, I've got a bad day, is that if we can just really capitalize on these heavier foods, these bigger volume foods that inherently have less calories, we're going to cut our daily calorie intake without feeling like we're dieting, without feeling like we're restricting. Okay? All right.
moving to our next slide. The kind of main focuses, aside from high water content, like I said, water weighs something, but it has no calories. So higher water content foods are going to give us bigger volume for less calories. Another big um, focus in volumetrics is fiber. Fiber keeps us full. Fiber digests slowly. Fiber is something that we can really incorporate into our diet to get better bang for our buck and to feel less hungry between our meals or throughout the course of a day. Fiber is a type of carbohydrate, so this is not necessarily a low-carb eating plan. This isn't keto. You don't have to get rid of all your, you know, carb foods. The only way that we get fiber is by eating carb foods. We want you to think of things like vegetables and fruits and whole grains, beans or legumes. Fiber, um, two different types. We've got the kind that cannot be digested and the kind that is, um, both of which we can get as long as we're eating a good variety of high fiber foods. But for the kinds that can't be digested, it really helps to facilitate movement in our GI tract. It helps to um, make sure that we're going to the bathroom. We all know we want to do that. The kind of fiber that is not digested can actually help to slow down how fast food does move through our GI tract. And as long as it stays in our stomach or as long as our body's working on it, we're less likely to feel physically hungry because our body's working on what we fed to it last time. Higher fiber foods also encourage us to slow down our actual eating. It takes longer to chew higher fiber foods. Um, I want to use the example of a nice hearty piece of whole grain, whole wheat toast versus like Wonder Bread, like white toast. We all know that if you take that white toast, it kind of starts to like disintegrate in your mouth. I don't want to use the word melt, but it just kind of like, there's not a whole lot to it. You don't have to chew it a whole lot versus hearty, higher fiber bread, piece of toast. You may have to chew, 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 break it down before you can swallow it. Well, by slowing down our eating, actually how much time it takes to start and finish a meal, we're giving our body more time for stretch receptors to be activated, for the stomach and the brain to have that conversation and tell us that we're feeling full, but it also engages us more in the act of eating and we can get more satisfaction from our foods when we are engaged with them longer. Um, and this is an aspect of mindful eating that I will talk about in just a bit. The most recent data suggests that the average American consumes less than 10 grams of dietary fiber a day you can see that a minimum goal for most people is 28 to 35. So there is a very big difference between where we're at and where we need to get to. Um, this eating plan is really gonna help to increase your daily fiber intake by focusing on those right types of foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and legumes. Um, if you are one of those folks that does not consume a whole lot of fiber, um, two things to minimize any negative consequences. And we all know what I'm talking about. If we try to eat too much fiber at once, we can start to feel bloated, we can get gassy. Some people will even experience the opposite and they'll start to get constipated. So the two strategies are one, increase your fiber slowly. General rule is aim to add five grams of fiber a day per week. So for this first week, let's see, how can I add five grams? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, okay. Now I know that that food, whatever it is, that extra five is in my daily intake. The next week, add another five. The next week, add another five until you get up to that about 30 a day. The other thing is to make sure that you are staying very well hydrated while you increase your fiber intake. If you increase fiber, but you're dehydrated and you're not drinking enough water, that fiber likes to kind of just get stuck. We need to make sure we're staying hydrated so we're helping it to move through us. The other nutrient that this eating plan focuses heavily on is protein. Um, reason being, protein keeps us fuller longer. Our body takes a pretty decent amount of time to fully digest protein foods. Going back to the example of a bowl of cereal versus an egg white omelet in the morning. Well, the protein in the egg is what is helping you to stay full between breakfast and lunch and not need to have a snack an hour later. The other thing that protein does, or when we eat protein, is it has a very high 
thermic effect in our body. So one of the elements of a strong metabolism, a part of our metabolism, right? This is the process that burns energy, is the thermic effect of food. Basically what that says is how much energy does it take to digest food? Protein foods have a very high thermic effect, meaning that it takes the body a lot of energy to break down, digest, and absorb protein. Well, this is a good thing because when you think about consuming calories, eating less calories to match, right, your caloric expenditure, how much you're using in a day, if you consume 100 calories from protein, but your body needs to use, let's say, 20 of those 100, well, you're only netting 80. That means you didn't actually get 100 of those calories because your body had to use some of that energy to get that protein broken down versus something like an Oreo. If you consume 100 calories, your body doesn't really have to work all that hard, get that sucker digested and absorbed. And so if it only uses three or five of those 100, well, now you're actually consuming 95. So it's the same going down your, your throat, but in the back end and in the process, that protein food, that piece of chicken, whatever, is only actually going to provide you the 80 versus a 95. Well, now you add this up day after day, meal after meal, week after week, and the weight can start to come down without it feeling like you're on a diet, like you're hungry, like you're deprived. So that's why protein is so important um, in this eating plan. When we say choosing lean proteins, what that means is low-fat proteins. Two reasons. One, the, for the same reason that we talked about before, fat is very calorically dense, it's energy dense. You're going to get a very small package with a lot of calories. So we don't want our proteins, things like bacon and sausage and broth. And we've got a very high fat content. Well, a lean broth versus a high fat broth, they're going to provide the same weight in our bellies, but one is going to have significantly more calories than the other. So we want to maximize on that by choosing those low fat proteins, things like our skinless poultry, whether that be chicken or turkey, lean beef options or red meat. Generally speaking, if the cut has the word loin or round in it, it is going to have the least amount of marbling and the least amount of fat content versus something like prime rib or a ribeye. You know, it's got all that marbling and all that fat in it. Um, lean pork, like a pork tenderloin, various seafoods, low-fat dairy, whether that be skim or low-fat milk, low-fat cottage cheese, low-fat yogurt, um, egg whites, tofu and legumes or beans. Um, and tofu and beans have the double benefit of not only are they a lean protein source, they also provide us fiber. Okay? Uh, the other reason why we want to focus on those low-fat proteins is because most animal-based proteins, we think of things like chicken, beef, pork, that sort of stuff. When we consume it with its fat, a lot of that fat is coming in the form of a saturated fat. And when we look at overall heart health, we know that we want to really maximize any type of fat that we consume, primarily from unsaturated fat sources. These are going to be things like a little bit of nuts. This is going to be things like a little bit of olives. Um, this might be something like a salmon filet. Uh, these are going to be our unsaturated fats. So we definitely don't want to eat a whole lot of fat because, again, it's not going to provide us the same amount of weight in our stomachs for that low calorie benefit as a fruit, veggie, fiber, and protein. But when we do consume those fats, please make sure that you're focusing primarily on unsaturated fat sources. All right. So what does a sample day look like? Um, this could be a frittata, basically a fancy way to say like an egg omelet or an egg scramble um, with some low fat cheese and various vegetables. What kind of veggies do you like? Mushrooms, onions, peppers. Um, I like to put asparagus, zucchini, whatever you like. Uh, we've got a couple cups of different fruits. Melon has a very high water content. So again, looking at the grams of the weight of the serving versus the calories. Really good bang for your buck. And then a glass of low fat or skim milk, that low fat dairy, it's going to give us a source of protein. But by choosing the skim or low fat, we're just minimizing the saturated fat that we would otherwise be getting from this glass of milk. For lunch, we might have a broth based vegetable soup. 
again, we want to minimize the creams and those heavier, higher fat uh, soups and choose chicken, vegetable broth, hopefully lower in sodium if you can. Uh, open faced turkey sandwich, maybe that's on a whole wheat piece of toast or rye toast. Maybe you do have a little something sweet in there, a piece of fruit. Dinner could be any type of salad, really maximize on tons of vegetables, right? Not only are they going to be high water content, high volume, but they're going to provide us so many vitamins and minerals and antioxidants, get tons of color in there, whatever you like, switch it up with, with, with the seasons, right? Um, we might have that piece of salmon or lean meat. Um, I put on there rice, cauliflower, and broccoli. I should have had my little bag here, but this is a really, really popular um, product that you can just purchase in your frozen vegetable section. You can also make it yourself. For those of you that don't know, rice, not rice, but it is the verb to rice broccoli or to rice cauliflower. And it's basically just taking a head and breaking it up, cutting it up into pieces that are about the same shape and size of like a rice kernel. Um, you can mix that rice, broccoli, and cauliflower into a half cup of a whole grain wild rice or brown rice. That's going to have more fiber. So again, more volume for less calories. And maybe you have a snack of uh, some low-fat yogurt. Maybe you have a snack of some low-fat cottage cheese with some tomatoes or a couple berries. Um, I have some other ideas. Maybe you're going to do some salsa, some fresh tomato salsa or fresh fruit salsa or something, and you use vegetables as dippers. So if you're going to do like a tomato or a pico or something like that, maybe you take some bell peppers or you take some celery or carrots or cucumbers, right, and kind of dip those. You can eat a lot of that for a relatively small amount of calories compared to something like 15 potato chips. And let's get real, 15 potato chips is not satisfying. It's not enough, like, oh, I want more, it tastes good, but then you're still hungry for the reasons that we've talked about. Um, other things that you can consider with your dinner meal, for example, um, would be zucchini noodles or spaghetti squash. So these are great alternatives, really incorporating those low calorie, high fiber, high volume vegetables in place of just traditional like white pasta noodles. Think about one cup of cooked pasta, it's about 200 calories versus one cup of cooked zucchini noodles is about like five to 10. You can eat cups and cups and cups and cups and cups and it's huge amount on your plate for the same amount of calories as one cup of pasta. And let's get real, when we go to Olive Garden, they're not serving us one cup. And then they're not just serving us one bowl. We can get multiple bowls in one meal. So these calories just add up really quickly. But at the end of the day, you're walking away with the same amount of weight kind of in the stomach, right? Well, let's walk away with a heavy full belly that's got a quarter of the amount of calories so that we can start to see that weight coming off. All right. So this topic of satiety and fullness. Um, this can be both physical and mental, right? So there is an idea that we could eat to feel full, but we also eat because something sounds good or we're in the mood for something crunchy or something soft or whatever that might look like. So we do need to balance this out. And one way that we can really make eating so that we are not only full but satisfied at the end of a meal is to practice mindful eating, okay? Um, to eat mindfully is going to require some potential changes from how we might currently eat our foods. First and foremost, distraction. When we are distracted while we eat, it takes more food for our body to be satisfied from that meal because we're basically missing moments, right? How many of us have made some popcorn, go sit on the couch, watching TV, watching a movie, and before you know it, the whole bowl is empty, and you're like, where did it go? I don't, I'm already done. Where did it go? It's because we were distracted. We were not being mindful of what does this taste like? How crunchy is it? How salty is it? Really chewing it, right? And, and getting that sensory um, experience from, from the food. So we do need to reduce distraction. We need to turn the TV off. We need to turn our phones off. We want to sit at a table. We really want to minimize all of these external distractions so we allow our body and our mind to be engaged in this eating experience. 
you can find that by just doing that, that you can physically eat less and be just as satisfied because you've slowed down and because you've engaged all parts of your body that want to be engaged during the act of eating. Okay? With that is the slowing down. Some strategies to help folks slow down that might inherently be just a fast eater. Um, one, make sure that you plate all of your food. It's very common that we can eat straight out of bags or we can just kind of eat on the fly. And it's really important that we put our food portions on plates and we go sit down. Um, using smaller plates is a way to help us to slow down in that when we are done with that first plate, it gives us an opportunity to, I need to walk back into the kitchen to get my next helping if I'm going to, but in that period, that's extra time, whether that's seconds or minutes, to really let your brain and your stomach start to talk, right? Feel those stretch receptors, feel the weight of the food. It allows you to physically slow down so that it's not just all in front of you. And in five minutes, you know, the large plate is gone. Maybe in three minutes, the small plate's gone. Now you got to get up, you got to walk, you got to bring the plate in, you got to do this is all just time. Um, other folks will force themselves to put their fork or their utensil down between bites. Um, this really encourages finishing the bite. So may not have thought about this, but this is really common. And as you go through your day today or tomorrow and you're eating or you're snacking, I want you to be mindful of this. How often are you taking your next bite before you swallowed your previous? This is really common with popcorn. You take that handful, you put it on, you're chewing, you're chewing, and before you know it, you're putting your hand in and you're going for it. You haven't even swallowed all of the popcorn from the first bite before new popcorn's going in. This can apply to all of your eating experiences. So by putting your utensil down, it really can encourage you to be mindful, chew, swallow before you take your next bite. Other folks will bring in fluids. So they'll say, I'm going to have a sip of water in between each of my bites. Um, and then focusing on foods that just physically take longer to eat, which is another benefit of protein and fiber foods, because these things just take more chews to break down, to be ready to swallow than other more highly processed, higher fat, higher uh, simple carb based foods, like again, like Wonder Bread or Oreos, doesn't take a whole lot for those things to be swallowed. So this plan is a double benefit of the fiber and the protein because that physically can encourage you to eat more slowly. So just being mindful, part of that mindfulness is really identifying what I call above the neck hunger versus below the neck hunger. And this is gonna be the difference between hunger and appetite. Hunger is a physical response to needing to eat. Our hunger cues are our body's survival tool to ensure that we get nutrition, we get calories and energy so that we stay alive. An appetite is, that sounds good, that looks good. Hmm, somebody just offered it to me. Sure, yeah, I've always had a bedtime snack. So it's just what I do. It's my appetite. I can't go to sleep without X, Y, and Z. That is not a physical need to eat to survive. So there's a couple different ways to kind of encourage figuring out how those two things feel different to you. The first is, like I said, above the neck, below the neck. Above the neck hunger, more often than not, is going to be your appetite. It's going to be you want to eat. Something looks good, something sounds good, something smells good, you know something's gonna taste good. These are above the neck. Above the neck hunger generally comes on very quickly. So you see something, you see a food, you see a person eating, you're presented something, boom, I'm hungry. Are you hungry or do you just have an appetite for whatever that food is? versus below the neck hunger is generally a physical hunger. This is gonna come on gradually and you're gonna feel it in your stomach, whether that is it's physically empty, you might feel it kind of cramping or gurgling. I know I can hear mine, it's audible, sometimes kind of embarrassing, but I can hear it, right? Other below the neck hungers might be, you might feel shaky, you might feel tired or weak, kind of you're just lacking energy, right? Differentiating between these two can help us to be more mindful in terms of our choices. Because ideally, we are eating for physical hunger cues 
not just because looks good, smells good. I've always done it this way. I can't go to sleep without a bedtime snack. I, you know, whatever it might be, right? We do want to differentiate between these two and for the most part be eating out of physical hunger, not for these other reasons. There are of course exceptions to this rule. Birthdays, holidays, vacations. These are gonna be times when we might be eating for other reasons. Generally speaking though, the ratio or the balance of the frequency of these times for most people is out of balance. It's an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time we feed our physical self, or I say we feed our heart, right? We eat for a physical need. 20% of the time I feed my soul. My body doesn't need ice cream, but my soul does. And there's always gonna be a time for ice cream, but it just has to be only 20%. You have to be intentional. I want to practice mindfulness and get the most out of those bites so that I can really enjoy one scoop more than I might enjoy three because I want to get the most bang for my buck without having to eat, you know, 1200 calories from a pint of ice cream. So these are all kind of helpful strategies to incorporate those foods that we talked about earlier that we want to minimize, not remove, right? This is not a plan that says you can't eat them. It's just that we want to be doing them a lot less frequently and we can minimize their detriment if we can practice some of these skills. So being mindful between our physical hunger and an appetite. And then we want to make sure that we are satisfied at the end of a meal because just to feel full doesn't mean we're satisfied. How many of us have felt full? We felt that like heaviness in our stomach, but we still want to eat because we might not have been satisfied from that meal. By practicing more mindful eating exercises, slowing down, really experiencing what you're chewing, what does it taste like, what is this texture, swallowing those bites before taking your, really kind of engaging in your eating, you might find that you can start to get satisfaction and fullness from an appropriate amount of food without feeling like you need more. Okay. Also be mindful that this plan doesn't say these are the right foods, these are the wrong foods. When we say a lot of fruits and vegetables, you don't have to like them all. I don't like raw broccoli. I wouldn't eat raw broccoli on this plan. I'd eat cooked broccoli because I enjoy that. I get satisfaction from that food. Another thing that gets people into trouble with diets is that they feel like they have to eat stuff that they don't like. Nobody is going to want to continue on a plan miserable and they hate all the stuff that they're eating and they're always left unsatisfied at the end of the meal human nature is not going to want to continue that behavior so really focus on the stuff that you do get the most satisfaction from if there are specific proteins fruits vegetables whatever it might be that you enjoy more incorporate them in more often please don't feel like you have to eat stuff just because dr oz said oh this is the good one this week eat the stuff that gives you not only that Full factor when you walk away from the table, you're like, great, I've removed my hunger pains. I'm also really satisfied with that meal. It tasted good, it smelled good, it looked great on my plate, it was colorful and pretty, and there were all these different textures. That's what where we get satisfaction from. And a lot of times we miss out on that because we're just eating mindlessly, because we're not thinking about it, because we're not engaged, because we have a bunch of distractions going on at the same time. All right. So another little interesting factoid, um, if you consumed 100 fewer calories a day, you would lose 10 pounds in a year, not making any other changes, which is how most people's math would work out, right? As long as you didn't add 100 or 200 elsewhere. So these could be really simple swaps. Things like instead of using mayo, I'm gonna use mustard on a sandwich. Save 100 calories. I'm gonna use a leaner cut of bacon versus your regular bacon. I'm gonna use skim or low fat milk instead of heavy cream using smaller plates and bowls. Um, they've done tons of research to show that people can be just as full and satisfied on a smaller um, plate or bowl because our eyes and our brain see like no white space, right? So if we've got a big bowl versus a small bowl, we can put the same amount of food on both, but our brain with the larger bowl is gonna say, well, there's a lot of empty space. That's not gonna fit me well. Versus that smaller bowl, there's less white space, there's less empty space, it was really full, our brain's gonna go into that situation saying, wow, look at this thing, that's a lot of stuff. So just by being mindful of using, you know, lunch size plates or salad plates versus big old dinner plates, 
obviously watching your beverages. Um, it goes without saying that liquid calories just to like drink something versus the act of chewing and masticating, we just don't get the same full factor. Um, so it is important that we are consuming most of our calories, if not all of them, um, from whole things that require chewing. Uh, that, that physical act of eating just gives us a lot more of a full factor and it's going to help to slow down digestion because liquids just can go through our system a lot faster They're liquids versus solid. Um, being mindful of how big your bread is. You know, they make some wide pan loaves out there and those can easily have 150 calories a slice. Well, if we can go to a smaller loaf pan that's only 60 calories a slice, you still make a sandwich, you can still have two slices. Or maybe that wide pan loaf, instead of making a two slice sandwich, we're gonna make a one and we're just gonna use the one, the one wider pan. You know, you can cut calories that way. And then rice versus rice cauliflower. Um, you can even mix these. So some people say, oh, I don't know, I really like rice. I don't know if my family is going to get on board with this. Maybe you do 50% rice and 50% rice cauliflower, mix it together. I'll tell you the first time that I made a stir fry with rice cauliflower, no rice in it. My husband had no idea. He straight up asked me, I didn't realize we had rice in the house. When did you have time to make that? I told him that's not rice. This is just cauliflower mixed up and all this other stuff, some sauce, whatever. He had no idea. Um, also really popular is mashed cauliflower. Also a product you can buy out there, frozen vegetable section, and you can use that in place of or mixed into mashed potatoes, right? So we've got a starchy vegetable versus a non-starchy vegetable. By completely swapping in the non-starchy vegetable, save yourself some calories for the same volume or amount on the plate. Or if you're like, eh, I don't know, I really like me a potato. Okay, instead of making mashed potatoes with two or four potatoes, cut that in half and then mix in this mashed cauliflower. And now you've cut your calories, your carbs, all the stuff by 50% and you can still have the same portion on your plate. But in that same portion, you're now looking at less calories without feeling deprived, without feeling hungry. Um, some other tips, make sure you keep this stuff on hand, right? Out of sight, out of mind, in sight, in mind. If it's not available and you don't have it handy, it's gonna be really hard to follow through. If the house is full of a lot of these high energy dense foods, high calorie things, it's what you're gonna to gravitate towards. You've already invested the time and the money to go get it, to bring it home, to pay for it. You know, I, I get, we don't wanna do food waste. So let's just make sure that we're keeping our house stocked with a lot of these items, our fruits, our vegetables, cooked things. This plan does require some meal prep, right? So we're gonna to have to cook our proteins. We're gonna to have to make sure that we're keeping these frozen vegetables ready to go in the freezer. We're gonna to have to cook our whole grains and keep them in the fridge for the week. Maybe we're gonna to have to um, prep our beans and kind of keep those handy. So that is one thing that some people can feel is overwhelming, but if you start small and you just start to, let's say, add those five grams of fiber a day per week, you're gonna to start to be building on these new lifestyles and just keeping these more appropriate items ready to go in the house. Starting your meal with a broth-based vegetable soup or a large salad. Again, those non-starchy vegetables, a lot of volume, a lot of weight, very few calories. If that's the base in your stomach, there will physically be less room and there will physically be less kind of weight available for you to eat, whatever your you know, main entree might be. And so that's gonna help you to leave the table feeling full. You got the same weight of the food, but you got it for far less calories. Um, just replacing those high fat meats with those lower cuts that we talked about. If you are going to be doing any baking um, in place of butter and oil using pureed fruits like bananas, applesauce, um, we can do pineapple or not pineapple, pumpkin. Another one that might seem weird, but it does work, um, is pureed prunes. You can buy these like in the baby food section. They are a great alternative to butter and oil in chocolate based recipes. I've done it in cupcakes and cakes and buns and that kind of stuff. And you have no idea. Please obviously don't do it in something like a vanilla cake because the prunes are going to impart some color. The chocolate is going to cover that up. Um, adding vegetables to meat products, whether that be meatloaf or things like meatballs or burgers, chopping up some zucchini, chopping up some mushrooms, extra onions. Um, this is great in sauces as well, right? So if we're gonna make some type of pasta or zucchini noodle dish with a tomato-based sauce, 
we can add tons of vegetables to that sauce. And now on the plate, the, you know, 50% of the portion is going to be all of these cut up vegetables in there, very low calories, but we still get the benefit of the volume and the weight that they impart. Adding butternut squash to mac and cheese, it's creamy, it's orange, it mixes in really nicely. And then like we've talked about with either the rice or the pasta is using these more vegetable based options. Think of zucchini noodles or kind of eggplant in something like lasagna. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. So you don't have to go all zucchini noodles, but maybe every other layer instead of the pasta, we're building in those zucchini noodles. You can still put the same portion on your plate, it'll be hefty, but now some of that heft is coming from this high water, low calorie vegetable based thing rather than more of the meat, the cheese, the pasta noodles like that. 